first of all, very apropos to my Q&A on individuation is Carl Jung and Alcoholics Anonymous. The Twelve Steps is a Spiritual Journey of Individuation uh, by Ian McCabe. It has a, uh, a foreword by uh, Lance Owens, who is a very uh, prominent, I think it's, this is Lance Owens, isn't this the one? Uh, Dr. Lance Owens is an MD. Yeah. He's a very prominent uh, Union analyst. Good friend of Stephen Ellis. There's a Gnostic. Uh, right. Uh, uh, maybe not. Maybe this isn't the book. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's, he's got a great website. And he's got all these tapes and stuff. Well, any, anyway, um, as you see by the tabs that I've put on this book, I have plans for it because it's incredible how um, the 12 steps sort of suggest one path to individuation. It's a hold on to your hat, folks, path, but it's uh, nonetheless an interesting path. And it's one that's followed by all AA members, as I understand it. Um, and so, pardon? Bill W. Bill W. And, you know, we... We've gone on a couple of Royal Caribbean cruises, and they give you a schedule for the day, every day on these cruises, where there's a lot of alcohol, okay, there's, you know, like, Debbie and I would buy the wine deal so that you'd get a bottle of wine with dinner every night, right, and um, so... So, but on Royal, on Royal Caribbean, they'll have a they'll have a poster with with today's events. You know, what what telling you what city you're in because you've been inside a ship. All the time. <laughs> Where are we now? <laughs> and uh, and always at at like three forty four five or four forty five, there's friends of Bill. Okay. And I kept wondering, what the heck is Friends of Bill? And it, tur it turns out it's an AA meeting that they run every day on every Royal Caribbean ship. Oh, it's awesome, absolutely. Um, Do they have the gambling and all kinds of stuff on this ship? Is it in a sense? Gluttony, alcohol. Gluttony. <laughs> gambling. Exactly. And yes, behind the... With his doors. <laughs> okay, so, doors. so does anybody know the 12 steps? Um, all right. Maybe I should. I started meeting supplies a lot. So on the day they started to show me constantly. Carl Jung, I was like, oh, no, I'm going to do it. Oh, Carl Jung was instrumental in the, in the starting of Alcoholics Anonymous. All right. Uh, let me share with you the 12 steps because that's not a secret. Um, and uh, so step one is we admitted we were power powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Okay, so that's step one. Um, so you have to m admit that something's really wrong with your life. And um, later on in the book when it's talking about the Jungian implications, um, it's about how people reach rock bottom. You know, something happens to them that's just really awful in their lives. And of course, we've been talking about the Job archetype and how you're defeated, you have a big defeat, and then you lament, and then you're reborn. And so, the, so step one is about admitting that you have a big defeat. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Um, and so it's, um, in the Jungian sense, and we'll talk about it in Aeon, or Ion, we'll talk about it in Ion, um, what Jung talks about is the God image, the self, as the, the end of the spectrum that's part of your psyche that can restore you. Okay, it's a power greater than your ego. It's the crushing of the ego. 
uh, and and so now it's accepting that there is something in you that can help you. So from a Jungian analysis point of view, and I'm not a licensed analyst, so please don't take that. This is gospel, but but um, it basically says that uh, you recognize that there's something that's stronger than your ego. Okay, step three. Um, hmm? I don't know. It's just, it's like. I don't know. It's like. No. <laughs> okay, then. I'm explaining my humor. I was just curious. I actually knew somebody who struggled with this for years and don't, I don't think is capable of getting wealth from it because of an, an oversized ego. But it's more like a, um, what do they call it when a self-absorbed person, the narcissism, I think there's narcissistic. So I'm just wondering how that would, I mean, that's a whole side conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is an just, overinflated ego, though. But that's right. what that would that's be. That's what narcissism is. Okay, so that's why I'm thinking why some people might get stuck and are not able to get through the steps because of an ego which maybe they're not capable of. Yeah. Or they haven't accepted that it's their fault. Yeah. Right, and that there's something bigger than them that can save them. That's why when you laughed, it made me Well, I had a lot of reason for laughing, but I didn't want to bring any of them up because I might get political. Okay. We don't care if you get political. I know the rules. I'm not getting political. Okay. okay but All right, good point. All right. I, I think a lot of people, I mean, they, are, they don't want to admit it it's as bad as it is and then when they you know it's a lot of rationalizing and minimizing mm -hmm. and, yeah. and blaming you know outside of themselves so yeah so I think that's yeah. a big step for them a lot of them but. finger point well I'll tell you I, I'll tell you a brief story from my life and um, um, a couple th points one was that my grandfather was an alcoholic definitely uh, he never sought help for it uh, when he was 58, he had a stroke, and he was basically incapacitated for the rest of his life. He lived to be 68, so my grandmother had to take care of this decrepit old man for, um, yeah, for 10 years, and and so and everybody was punished in effect for not addressing it, for not grabbing him by the throat, and. Um, Anyway, there was uh, there was a woman who worked for me in Japan. She was Japanese, but she um, years before, when she worked with another American man, she'd gotten involved with him in a love affair, and then he got transferred back to the states. But she knew that he was an alcoholic at that time. She knew, but the Japanese don't understand alcoholism because Japanese don't tend to get it. Um, the, J the Japanese get, have lack two enzymes in their system that um, don't allow them to process alcohol the same way or don't allow them to process alcohol. So when they drink it, it just goes right out and it doesn't affect their physiology. So they can get falling down, stumbling drunk every day and puke all over the railway station and so on. But just like my friends. <laughs> yeah, but they don't they don't get they don't become alcoholic. Yeah. And so alcoholism per se is not a big issue in Japan. And um, so Yeah, so this is a bit of a complicated story, but anyway, um, Pardon? Japan. Too late, not Japanese. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, and we, we won't use names here, but um, anyway, uh, this woman um, came to me, or there, there was a bit of synchronicity. I was getting the Wall Street Journal, and about a week before this event, there was an article in the Wa Wall Street Journal which said that... Uh, there's only one way to deal with an alcoholic, and that is to threaten their job. 
okay? He said, the article said, and I still remember major pieces of this, the article said they won't quit for their family, they won't quit for their friends. The only thing that they'll quit for is if their job is threatened. And so the best thing you can do as an employer, and this is the Wall Street Journal advising employers, right? The best thing you can do as an employer is say, you're either going to a detox center or you're fired, one of the two. Okay, because it becomes pretty, um, pretty evident that these people are, are having. I've seen another approach work. Which was? The doctor says you're gonna, you have to stop drinking or you're gonna die. Well, okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and that's what I learned. I I called my uh, Japanese or. I guess it was a Japanese doctor. It might have been an American who was a doctor. But I called him on the phone for advice because I was, you know, in my early 30s and said, um, you know, uh, what happens if we don't get him to detox? And he says, well, he'll die. Very simply. And, um, and so the, so anyway, a week after I read this article, this woman comes to me in the office and says, well, we'll call this guy Joe so that I change his name. Joe is back in Japan and he, I've been with him at a hotel in downtown Tokyo for a week, but he's drinking way too much and I don't know what to do. And I said, well, okay, let's go over there and see what the situation is. So I go over to this hotel. The hotel is denying it, but in Japan, they have vending machines that sell these little um, pint bottles of Suntory whiskey. Now, Suntory whiskey, I think, is pretty much watered down from, from uh, you know, Kentucky's sour mash, but, it's, but anyway, Suntory whiskey is good, and it's a staple in Japan, and they sell it in vending machines, right, in the, in the hallways, in the hotels, so, um, so I go into this room, and there's a wastebasket, a big wastebasket, you know, like, like you see in a schoolroom, right, and it was literally heaped with these Sun, Suntory whiskey bottles. He had been there for a week, and he had just been putting bottle after bottle in there. And the management knew there was a problem, but the Japanese didn't know what to do about it. And um, so they just let it go on and let it, let him keep buying Suntory. And so I go into the room, and he's sort of awake, and. I really didn't know what to do, and so I called a, um, I called a guy who was like the leader of the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan, and I said, you know, what should I do? And he says, get him out of Japan, because if the Japanese find out about him, they're going to arrest him and put him in jail. And I said, whoa, he says, get him on a plane out of Japan for sure. All right, so this is like a Friday night, right? And so I basically couldn't even talk to this guy for the first 24 hours. I just sat there and said, you're not drinking anything more. We'll get food for you, but that's it. And so I just sat in there in the room with him for 24 hours. And then I told him, uh, if you don't go to detox, um, I'm going to report this to your employer. Now, his employer was a major banking organization. I won't say who, but he was a very, very influential guy. He was like the number two guy 
in this very major banking organization. He was going around the world signing these multi-million dollar, more like billion dollar bonds, I mean huge bonds. And Pardon? Well, yeah, probably there's something there, yeah. So anyway, um, then, so I said, if, if you don't go to this detox center, you have to call up your boss and take vacation for a month, and you have to go to this detox center in the U.S., and if you do that, um, then I'm not going to report this to your boss. But if you don't agree to do it, I'm going to call him up today and, um, you know, report what's going on here. And um, so he said, oh, yeah, okay, I'll go. And um, so I bought him and this Japanese woman a ticket to um, Philadelphia to where this Chit Chat Farms is. It's a detox center uh, from Tokyo, okay? And, and um, I took him to Narita Airport and put him on the airplane. And her ticket was arrive in Philadelphia one day and eight hours later fly back to Tokyo. So she was only gone from Tokyo for 48, like 48 hours, right? Um, and, but she did it. Yeah. So she, yeah. So she got on the plane with them. They flew to Philadelphia. She turned them over to a man in white, in white coat and <laughs> came back. Okay, so a month later he comes back and he's detoxed and everything seems hunky-dory. He says, thank you, Skip, you did a great thing for me. You saved my life. Now I'm going back to my job, which was in another country. Um, and um, so I said, okay, I want you to call me every week at 8 p.m. every Thursday. I want you to call me on the phone uh, and tell me everything's okay. And if you don't do that, um, if you miss by even an hour, I'm going to call your boss. You are tough. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> don't they shoot people like that? <laughs> right. <laughs> Disappear in the night. <laughs> right. So, um, so anyway, um, he came back and everything was fine. And after we did this routine for about six or eight months, he said, well, I don't need to call you every week. Every, everything's hunky-dory here. And, you know, I wasn't his AA sponsor, but I, but I, didn't, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize it, but I it basically was acting like a sponsor, as described in this book. And um, so anyway, so we stopped, and I didn't know any better. I was 34 years old or something like that. And, uh, you know, I'm far away in Japan, et cetera. And so then about 10 months later, uh, I get a call from the Japanese woman again. It's like a weekend again, and uh, she says, we're at the Narita View Hotel at the, out at the airport, and uh, I've got the same problem, and, uh, you know, can you come help me? And so I go out there, and he'd been there for several days again, and he was really in a tough shape. And as I walked in the door, um, the phone was ringing, and I answer the phone, and lo and behold, it's his boss. I knew it was his boss. And I said, well, we have a little problem with Joe here. <laughs> and um, uh, I guess you may know that the problem is alcoholism. And the guy on the phone says, yeah, yeah, I knew. And I said, so I want you to tell me whether his health insurance will take care of him if I send him to detox again. And so... He said, okay, I'll call you back. So an hour later, he calls back, and sure enough, his health insurance would cover it, and the bank would cover his trip back to the States again. So we did it a second time. Okay, so this time he comes back, and uh, he gets into AA uh, in this other place, which I won't identify. And, um, and he does that for several months, and then... Um, 
I left Japan and this woman who was his paramour uh, says, well, if our company is falling apart, then I'm going to go to this other country and marry this guy. So I said, okay, what could possibly go wrong with this? <laughs> but by her caring for him and, um, and taking care of him, keeping him in AA, uh, they, had, they were very happily married for 10 years. And then, then he died. He, he, was, he was about 60, I suppose. Maybe liver was, gave out. Yeah, finally his liver gave out, I think. But but they were very happily married for 10 years and everything was hunky dory. Um, was he drinking those 10 years? No. <laughs> I, my understanding is that he wasn't. Okay. So, anyway, it's a very pernicious disease. So, uh, going back, let, let me quickly get through the other. So, that's uh, one, one story. Step three made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Now, I think in Jungian analysis, you're learning how to deal with yourself, which is, is your personal other personality, but here we're, the alcoholics are using the God metaphor. Okay, step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So in other words, they had to look at all their shadow and all their experiences, all the bad things that they had done. Step five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of all of our wrongs. Okay, so that's taking your sponsor and letting your sponsor know all your stuff. Well, I never did that. I didn't know these 12 steps until today, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, step six, we're entirely ready f to have God remove all these defects of character. So leaving the, the, some stronger force than your ego is going to fix you. Uh, step seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Okay, so that's prayer and so on. Step eight, made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make it amends to them all. I could get that with the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a big step. <laughs> that's a big, big step, making a list of all the people you have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can... I feel emotion about that um, because, I mean, just to give you an example, the one case that I know that really hurt me was um, in Japan, and I, there's no way I could make amends anymore, but um, I had flown to Hokkaido one time, and there was this taxi driver who was great with English, and he was a hell of a salesman. So I ended up hiring him as a salesman in my company and let him give up his taxi driving job, which had been supporting his family and everything had been cool. And all of a sudden I blow in and I'm a fare in his taxi and now I've hired him out of his taxi to work for me. And, um, and I don't know, very quickly his marriage fell apart. And uh, for reasons I don't understand, but his, his whole life fell apart around that. And so... Uh, yeah, well, I don't re really remember all the details of this, but um, he worked for me for maybe six months, and then he just went weird. And, um, you know, you can't always predict something like that. And, <laughs> yeah, I guess. It's the ugly American archetype. Yeah, I had good intentions. Huh? Exactly. Pardon? Had good intentions. Yeah, really I had good bad. intentions, but yeah. man, sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> out. Okay. So, and I, I would say that any executive has this problem because somehow you've hurt somebody along the, 
along the way, even if you had the best of intentions. Okay, step nine, made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Well, I just couldn't do it because I didn't know who these people were after years. Uh, step 10, uh, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Well, that I've done. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to increase our conscious contact with God as we understand him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So uh, prayer and meditation. Step 12, uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to protect and to practice these principles in all our bar affairs. Okay, well, um, those all seem useful things, and they also also seem very logical things from a union analysis point of view. Um, so, in the next video, I'm going to read the letter that Bill Wilson wrote to um, Dr. Young, and the letter that Dr. Young wrote back to him, which is very, very interesting. So.